Old School Lane Casual Chats is brought to you by OldSchoolLane.blogspot.com and is associated with Channel Frederator, Manic Expression, The Comic Book Cast, and The Araminta Show. Welcome to a new episode of Casual Chats. I am Patricia, and I am back with Jim Bevan. Welcome back, Jim. Always glad to be here, Patty. So today we're going to be discussing about, uh, which is, believe it or not, a first-timer for me, a video game company. Uh, More specifically, Telltale Games, who recently shut down after being around for about almost 15 years at this point, if you can believe it. So, um... A true true tragedy in the industry. Alexa, play Despacito. Oh yeah, yeah, very much so, and we'll we'll definitely discuss about that later. So, um, Jim, what was the first game that you were introduced to that had the Telltale name um, mark? Uh, first game I ever played was uh, Sam and Max Save the World. Yeah, that was my introduction to Telltale. I was a huge fan of uh, the first Sam and Max game that came out back in '93, and I was glad to see it finally got a return. Yeah. Um, as for me, I think that probably the first game that I may have heard about in terms of, oh, you know, this was done by Telltale, was probably Strong Bad's cool game for attractive people. Yeah, I had heard of that, but I never really got into Homestar Runner, so that was one that I passed over. But I had, did hear good things about it. Yeah, um, as yeah, I'm actually a, a bit of a Homestar Runner fan when I was in college. Uh, I remember that it was like one of the big web series um, that kind of like was spreading around in a time in which those were very limited. You know, the only ones that yeah. you had were like stuff from Newgrounds. But yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that when I, you know, when I when I first heard about like, oh man, you know, a web series was getting a video game, I was actually pretty intrigued. Now. Um, you know, going into the discussion of Telltale, you know, when they were first starting out, you know, they were basically just starting off with, like, adaptations based off of, like, movies and TV shows and old properties such as, as you said before, like Sam and Max. Yeah, they did Sam and Max. They did some based on Bone, which is, uh, it was a comic that was big in the 90s, but I think has kind of fallen into obscurity. And they did some based on CSI, which I think was one of the things that I initially wrote off because that was back in the time when anything that was associated with a TV show or a comic book was one of those cheap hidden objects games. Yeah, that's true. So, I mean, if you were to talk about, like, you know, stuff back then, you know, where, oh, if it was made by Konami or Capcom or Virgin Games, then, yeah, I mean, most mostly Disney stuff, then, yeah, we would be, like, all over it. But I think nowadays when it comes to, like, oh, you know, there's a TV show that's going to get a video game or a movie that's going to get a video game, it seems like it's kind of, like, pushed aside as, like, oh, it's going to suck. Yeah, uh, but we are we have thankfully seen a uh, change in that. We know now that it's there are people who are trying to make it so that it's not just a cheap cash in and actually trying to make a quality product that can stand on with the uh you know stand up with the source material and i think telltale was influential in spearheading that yeah i think another thing that was very unique about telltale was that it was essentially trying to revive the point and click adventure genre which was pretty much dead at that point oh yeah i mean that was a Pretty much, adventure games kind of died in '98, and I know, and no one wanted to pick up on them again. So, a few people who had Lucas Arts who said, "You know, this genre still has life in it. We can bring it back." When it found a Telltale, and they helped bring about, I think, a new—I uh, don't know if you call it a, a, gold, a new golden age, but we're definitely in the silver age of point-and-click adventures. I'd say. Yeah, yeah, sure. Very similar to how you know when Cinderella was called a comeback for Disney. You know, they basically call, like, the 50s all the way throughout maybe the late 60s the Silver Age. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting because um, I remember when, you know, Telltale was, like, big, you know, making their announcement about all the games that were going to be coming out, whether it be, like, puzzle games or whether it be, like, point-and-click adventure games. And then eventually I think they started hitting, like, the mainstream when... Um, 
you know, when I think it was either like with the Back to the Future game or with the the Walking Dead um, series. Walking Dead was definitely when they hit their stride. I definitely say made their big impact, but they started with Back to the Future mainly because they were able to get back so many of the original cast, including uh, Christopher Lloyd and I believe Tom Wilson also. Yeah, um, most, yeah sure, I, definitely, no. I think that Tom Wilson and even Michael J. Fox made a small little cameo. So, yeah, uh, A.J. Locasio, who uh, played as Marty, I think this was, like, one of the very first roles that I can recall him in. Um, nowadays, he's pretty much well-known for, like, uh, Voltron, Legendary Defender. He's the voice of, um, you know, Prince Loder, and uh, he's uh, Han Solo in Star Wars Forces of Destiny. Oh, neat. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad he's gone on to bigger things. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think that, uh, you know, when I first heard about that game, uh, I think it was like, I don't know, I think it was probably maybe James Rolfe's interview with AJ when he was talking about like, what was it like being uh, the voice of Marty McFly in Back to the Future? And I think that, uh, you know, since there wasn't like anything new with Back to the Future, like, uh, you know, until maybe like 2015, when you remember that whole, oh, um, you know, it's 2015. So in Back to the Future 2, this is when the future happened. And, you know, the whole, um, you know, selfless sneakers were actually being sold to, you know, benefit uh, Michael J. Fox's Parkinson disease, um, you know, research. Um, yeah, but for the most part, I think that, you know, Back to the Future was kind of like, you know, still in our pop culture, but probably not as much as it is now. No, uh, definitely not. Still, it was a nice little touch they had to, uh, you know, it was a nice, I'd say, continuation. Yeah. And it really took the franchise in a much, a much more interesting way. I mean, we saw how the future would be like if Biff ran things, but the uh, the future run by a psychotic well, not psychotic, but I guess jaded and amoral Doc Brown was equally terrifying in its own way. That is true. And, you know, I can't forget about the Monkey Island fans because there was also the Tales of Monkey Island that came out in 2009, which I did hear about. Like, I think Game Trailers did a video on it, like, a long time ago, but I never got to play it. Essentially, from what I heard, it was like, oh, you know, it's, it's bringing back, like, the, the roots of the original Monkey Island games into, like you know, what 20, you know, 2009 was. And essentially, like mentioned before, it was essentially just, you know, bringing back the adventure genre for a new generation. Yeah, and you can definitely tell they were drawing inspiration from their days at LucasArts, especially with some with the puzzle design and with some of the humorous, uh, some of the humorous com uh, item descriptions. Like there was one I remember, um, if you tried to combine a magnifying glass with a blank piece of paper, Guybrush would say, Hey, now I can see an extreme close-up of a blank piece of paper. That's not as useful as I hoped. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's true. Yeah. Truthfully, though, I do. While I do appreciate that, I still kind of prefer the original two Monkey Island games, mainly because I think that the revival that Telltale did, while it wasn't bad, it definitely seemed to be falling into that uh, two thousand late two thousands genre of being like a little too droll and sarcastic josh whedon style humor at times yeah fair enough and i think also like the um, the late 2000s was <laughs> around the time in which when the whole um you know retro revival thing was just starting out like we had yeah. you know the the indie titles like super meat boy kind of like establishing that hey we don't need to revive old genres from 20 years ago to appeal to the nostalgic yeah. crowd you know the likes of mega man 10 and no mega man 9 yeah mega man yeah, 9 mega man, uh, and mega then, man 9 and braid and um, Bastion and Bastion, Shovel Knight. Yeah, Shovel Knight. Uh, um, let's see. Yeah, there, like you know, too many to count. But it was essentially. Too many. Oh yeah, that too. It was essentially just that particular time period, which um, I think we're you know we're kind of still on that trend today. But you know, this was back in its infancy. To be fair. Yeah. True. Um, but uh, yeah, but definitely The Walking Dead was definitely the game that kind of like brought in to the, you know, more mainstream attention for Telltale Games when 
it was essentially a different story that's not featured in either the comics or in the TV series. And, you know, very similar to like something like Mass Effect in which you got to make a decision about, you know, whether you want to kill this character or this character or whether you want to steal this item or, yeah. you know, save it for somebody you, else. How are you going to divvy up food among survivors when you only have a limited amount? Right. Yeah, and that was what drove me in because I am not really a fan of zombie fiction, so I had never seen any episodes of The Walking Dead because it just didn't interest me. But when I heard about how they were going for the old uh, you know, RPG style, choices have consequences, that's what drew me in. And it did feel compelling. I mean, admittedly, looking back on it now, they were kind of all guiding you to a predestined path, like certain characters were going to die no matter what, even if you saved them earlier. But still, it felt like for the for the moment you did have a, you did have a say in how things were going to end and it put you in some tr- tricky situations too i think the the one that stuck out for me most was in the first chapter well it, one of the moments that stuck out for me most in the first chapter when lee has to save one of two people one of whom is a potential ally but also knows he's a fugitive on the run for murder and you're just thinking okay this guy has skills but he could blow your secrets is it okay to sacrifice him Mm hmm. Yeah, definitely. So um, another thing that, you know, Telltale was, you know, I think this was also a thing that was around at the time that they would release, you know, these games episodically, you know, like, if you want to be able to find out what happens next, and you have to either wait for the next chapter to load, or you have to purchase it, which, you know, for the most part, it's still a thing, but not really that much anymore. I think a lot of people kind of complain about that because it just like stops the story and it doesn't flow as well as like a continuous structure. Right. I mean, I understand why they have to do it, like for, say, budgetary reasons or because of what the team is working on if they're doing other projects. But it can get annoying, especially when you've had other smaller studios that don't have the resources doing this, like the guys who made games like Dream Machine or Dirt Journey Down or Kentucky Route Zero that took upwards of six years to get to their final chapters. Yeah, and then, you know, even games like Cave Story, in which it took one guy 10 years to do. Right. Uh, So, I mean, I understand the dedication is there, but I also think it's a good sign of showing when you need your resources. You also have to consider if some of these events, um, if they would, like, do the last-minute rewrites. That is true. That that is also a possibility that maybe uh, maybe t- play testers who played a chapter of the game maybe didn't like a particular decision or a particular character, yeah. and maybe they have to write something at the last minute while you know the episode yeah. is being released. Yes, yeah. I mean the, it, you have to have the foresight there. You don't want to end up with huge plot holes or making a final chapter that'll end up being received worse than the finale of How I Met Your Mother. Oh, don't tell Chris that. He would be so pissed about it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, I'm glad he's not here then, so I didn't dredge up any bad memories. Yeah. (laughs) Sorry, Chris, if you listen to this. But, yeah. uh, And and also, um, I think another thing that Telltale was able to do that was kind of like... DOA for a lot of video game companies was that, you know, a lot of people, they constantly, you know, they they theorized that one of the reasons why Telltale Games fell down was because they were, for the most part, adapting, you know, TV shows and movies. And because nowadays you have to pay, like, royalty fees and money so you can be able to use the rights for it, that maybe they weren't able to make as much money because of that. And, you know, that is a detriment, sure, but... Oh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, that could be a reason, too. It also could be because they were just overworking themselves on so much. Like, in 2017, they put out Season 3 of The Walking Dead. They put out Season 2 of Minecraft Story Mode. They put out the Guardians of the Galaxy series. And they put out the first few chapters of the second Batman series. So... You're going to get burnout eventually. That is true. And Telltale was never like a huge company. They were like a small company with like at least what? Like a, almost like a few hundred people at least? I think about, yeah, like 200 some people I think it was. Yeah. So, I mean, we're not talking about like a, a video game company that has like thousands of employees. We're talking about like a small, yeah. you know, company. Uh, right. So, you know, them yeah. trying to do all that at once, you know, of course it can create a lot of burnout and maybe, you yeah. know, inconsistent quality for their products. Yeah. And that's some of the news that's come out now since the company's gone under. Crunch time was, un- was a norm. There was very little morale. 
uh, they didn't have much chance to update their their engine because they were just constantly working on so many projects. Yeah, and not to mention, yeah. you know, there was I, I remember when the Wolf Among Us came out, there was like this there was there was like mixed reviews talking about like the inconsistent quality of the game. See, I didn't really have a problem. I didn't really notice any of that. I don't know, maybe it's because it's been a while since I played it, but I actually found The Wolf Among Us to be one of their best works. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, like I said, it's been a while since I played, so maybe I'm just forgetting about the cracks that showed. Sure, sure, and that, that's to be fair. But the, the point I was getting across when it came to like the adaptations of TV shows and movies was that, you know, as mentioned previously, you know, back... Th- then, you know, it was, like, pretty common that, you know, companies would actually take the time to, you know, create, um, you know, pretty decent adaptations, you know, for video games based off of a movie or a TV show. But, like I said, in more recent years, you know, they pretty much became cash grabs. So I think that, you know, with Telltale kind of helping with, like, Walking Dead and Game of Thrones and, you know, Batman and Guardians of the Galaxy and such... They were able to maybe um, kind of help with, you know, creating the path of other companies doing the same thing. Yeah, I definitely think they could have definitely helped if they had maybe had some extra resources available so that they weren't overworking people or maybe even just like branch out and try to come up with a new IP so that people weren't just constantly getting tired of the same old adaptations. Yeah, that's true, yeah. Uh, I I think that, you know, they were trying to make their own IPs, but I think it probably either didn't make as well as maybe their adaptations, or maybe they tried to, but maybe maybe the pitches didn't go very well. It's kind of hard to say. Yeah, like the only only original work I can think of that they ever made was this obscure game called Nelson Tether's Puzzle Agent, and... Pretty much no one remembers that, so maybe that was what set them on their course of saying, okay, the original stuff's not selling, let's keep doing adaptations. Yeah, I guess so. Which is a shame, because I would have liked to see, you know, a, a second chance of them doing a, an original IP based off of, you know, um, something, you know, original as opposed to, like, an adaptation, but, you know, who's to yeah. say what they would have done? Mm-hmm. Yeah, fair point. Fair point. Yeah, so uh, I guess, you know, if uh, do you have any other games that you want to highlight of Telltale right before we go over to the recent shutdown? Um, well, I got to give credit to Tales from the Borderlands because Telltale did what Gearbox couldn't and actually made a good Borderlands game. <laughs> Yeah, Borderlands, I mean, I've never really, you know, been a huge fan of, like, sand... I mean, I I, I am a, f- a fan of sandbox, but not, like, you know... Um, it, it, there's, like, a limit to, like, sandbox uh, for yeah. me. Like, I don't mind Grand Theft Auto. I don't mind uh, Saints Row. I don't mind Infamous. But if it's a game that, you know, there's just, like, this you know, open world with, like, barely anything to do unless, you know, you go far the distance and it just becomes, like, really, like, you're just driving around aimlessly and confusing, so... Yeah, pretty much that. And the char- and most of the- you only have a few NPCs that really stand out and there are so many freaking memes. <laughs> well, I mean, they were... Uh, Borderlands is with the claptraps, right? Yes, the clap tra- it has the clap traps, but oh. it also has like these little side quests and in descriptions that are all like memes and references. Like you start to wonder if Anthony Birch just hired a bunch of rejected Family Guy writers to work on the script. Oh my god! Yeah, I'm just gonna yeah. say it right here, I'm not a big meme fan. So, um, I I I, I mean, I used to see like so many jokes about clap trap that you know it's like oh you know th- this yeah. robot making a bunch of jokes. It's like it was everywhere, and I was like, I, ugh, I don't care. You know. You, that has to be tough, though, you're not being a big fan of memes, especially because you've covered so much Nickelodeon, and you have seen how much that's gotten memed. Oh, I try to ignore it. Uh, for the best. But yeah, Tales from the Borderlands, I mean, if you're not a Borderlands fan, if you do get put off by like, the shooting and the lifeless characters, this is definitely one to check out because it actually puts you in some really tough situations and it has a lot of action scenes i mean there is a giant mech fight at the end and i will say this giant mechs are always better than just shooting at the monster with an ordinary gun Mm, okay that sounds pretty cool yep uh any others uh the first season of their batman series was pretty good 
Um, I like how it switched things up with the mythos because for the longest time, you know, the high point of Batman games was the Arkham series. Oh yeah, that's true. And this didn't try to copy the Arkham series too much. I mean, they definitely had inspiration from a few sources, like, you know, giving Penguin the Cockney accent. But they changed the formula a bit. They made it so the Wayne family was actually kind of uh, dickish in how they ran their business in Gotham City. And it put Bruce in the hard point of not trying to so much avenge his parents, but also make up for their sins. Hmm, that's actually really interesting. Yeah, it was also interesting how they handled the Joker. You know how in the comics, Bruce creates the Joker when he hits Jack into the vat of a, and that, to the vat of chemicals. Yep. Well, here Joker is already established as having had that some kind of accident that made him into a John Doe. You first encounter him in Arkham after Bruce has been exposed to a chemical, and he's got the psychotic points, but he actually kind of strikes up a bit of a friendship with Bruce. Interesting. Yeah, and they kind of carry that over into the second season, where there's a potential to guide him away from going down the path of chaos. Of course, he's already a pretty psychotic character. Yeah. It's an intense scene in in the first game where, uh, you know who the Batman character Zaz is, right? Yeah, I've, yeah, I know who he is. Yeah, he's a, for those who don't know, he's a serial killer who, uh, every time he kills someone, he leaves a little marking on his body, like a little tally mark. So in the first game, Joker, just to have some fun, scratches another one into Zaz, and now he's, and which throws him off into chaos because his count is off, so he tries looking for someone to kill so his marks will match. Hmm. Yeah. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. I think it handled it well. Second season wasn't so well because this is another thing I've kind of noticed with Telltale. Their first seasons tend to be good, but when they move to the second seasons, they try to go a little more intense and darker. Like, I did not care for the second season of Batman from the first episode because of how they handled the Riddler, who is my favorite Bat Rogue. And they made him into, like, this Jigsaw-inspired serial killer who oh, has to put his... Oh, no. Yeah, I was not happy with how they treated him, you know. He doesn't even leave clues to his crimes. He just puts people in these death traps and, you know, if they don't answer his riddles correctly, then they get all their limbs chopped off and they bleed to death. That's not the Riddler. It's like, no, it's, like it's, it's, it's Billy for the, from Saw. Yeah, that's why I said that's the problem. They turn him into the Jigsaw Killer. Like, the Arkham games handled that well because there actually were puzzle traps, but this is just bad. Oh, and then they kill him off at the end of the, chap- of the first chapter. Mm, I see. Yeah, so like I said, that was a problem. And it was a problem I noticed kind of earlier, like in The Walking Dead Season 2, which I was looking forward to because of how much the first one impressed me. But you could definitely tell they were starting to go down that route of just like making things bleaker and darker just to try and up the stakes. I guess it makes a lot of sense because, um, you know, for two reasons, you know, obviously, you know, with The Walking Dead... And, you know, it, it does definitely go into a more dramatic route, you know, like seasons, um, you know, season two and three, you know, it, uh, you know, with them going over to like, you know, the the prison and then eventually they were going over to, you know, different uh, locations, like different states, eventually going over to Washington, D.C. and then eventually Alexandria to Virginia, you know, they meet up with a whole bunch of different like characters and, you know, maybe they wanted to up the stakes on that and maybe with the comics and let's not not forget that also the dark knight rises oh uh, yeah uh, you can definitely tell that was a bit of an influence but i'm just saying it became to the, it got to the point where like the dark twists were becoming a little too predictable yeah and that definitely kills any good aspect of the storytelling I mean, you can tell what's going to happen like in the walking dead season two you know the autistic girl isn't going to survive you know the pregnant woman is going to die after she gives birth because that's going to make things more dramatic. And it just it just kills any impact it's supposed to have. Yeah, and I think I can understand the argument that people make when it comes to the discussion of Game of Thrones and Walking Dead in which you should never, you know, get attached to a character because they'll be dead later on. It's like, yes, it brings a lot of tension and drama, absolutely. But I think I remember reading somebody who posted on Facebook or something saying that, you know, what's the point of, you know, being in, you know, um, in what's the point of um, putting a lot of time into a particular character when they're going to die anyway? Once they're killed off, you know, you're not going to be able to give as much attention to anybody else because they could be dead in the next episode. Exactly. It's, you know, it, it works for... 
creating a temporary scent of tension, but in the long run, it's ultimately futile. Yeah, which I can understand, you know, with the comics, you know, you know, every issue, you know, you, you build up a lot of characters and then eventually, event, you know, at some point in time, they do die. Like, I'm sure for anybody who has read the Walking Dead comics, you're, you know, for those people, they don't like the TV series because there are a lot of characters who don't get killed off until much later on. And then there are some characters who don't even um, survive either the first bit or they don't even exist. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I, and, uh, you know, the same thing with Game of Thrones as well, but Game of Thrones is a whole other level. So I'm, I'm not even going to cover that, but. Yeah, I haven't even bothered watching that. But I mean, look, I'm not against killing off characters if it serves a dramatic, if it serves a purpose for the story, if it's not just for shock value. And even when you do that, I'm kind of reminded of something that a Link Carr has said. When you're killing off a character, you either make sure that they're going out in a crowning moment of awesome. Or they're a complete scumbag who's getting their comeuppance for all the bad things they've done. Yeah, exactly. And I don't mind killing off characters either, especially if, you know, either they deserve it or if they do leave an impact on the characters and make them better. Like, I think that some of the best moments in any media involves with a character dying. But if it happens constantly over and over and over again, then it starts to wear off on people. I know people who pretty much just gave up after a... Well, I'm not going to spoil it, but a particular character that they loved very much so from the very beginning dies, and they felt it was just incredibly unjustified. And they pretty much just quit the show afterwards. I'm, I'm sure you are, know who it, I'm talking about, but I'm not going to go over that. But I won't give any spoilers either. I'm just going to say that their reactions are justified. Yes, very much so. So, um, yeah, um, basically, I think that um, you know, with the fact that Telltale was going into this dark direction was pretty much, you know, following the trends of the time in which when people were getting sick and tired of the cartoony over the top stories that were portrayed in various movies and cartoons and, you know, with the whole Dark Knight leading into a darker direction that, you know, oh, maybe this is going to be like the new trend of darker directions with, you know, we already had like yeah. Mad Men and then eventually of, as mentioned before, like Breaking Bad. And, yeah, and Sons Walk of Anarchy. Yeah, Sons of Anarchy, Walking Dead eventually came out, and eventually Game of Thrones. So it was definitely leading more yeah. towards like a more darker and serious direction, which was pretty much around at the time. And I think with yeah. the Marvel movies, it kind of like cushioned the blow of let's just make things fun. Yeah, that's. I definitely agree with you. I definitely think that Telltale should have gone the Marvel route and not the DC route because, I mean, let's be honest, things have been kind of bleak for a while now in the real world. We need some escapism. Yes, exactly. I mean, with everything that's going on recently, something like fun is what's getting a lot of attention nowadays. I mean, if you want to make a more realistic story, you know, that's going that's talking about what's going on, then yeah, absolutely, you should tell stories about that. But you know, um, for a lot of people, escapism in media has been around since media itself came about. When people were going through the Great Depression, cinema yeah. was becoming popular because it was escape from the fact that, hey, I'm starving and I'm poor and I'm living off the streets. Exactly. World War Two, same thing. You know, m movies right. and, you know, radio programs were becoming popular. Um, you know, all the, the lies that McCarthy was talking about in the 1950s. You know, people yeah. were watching uh, I Love yeah. Lucy and, and Dick Van Dyke and the Honeymooners right. and stuff like that. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, people, people like, I mean, my high school history teacher served in the Vietnam War. And he said one of the highlights of his time there, as hellish as it was, was when he and his buddies could relax at camp and watch Star Trek. Yeah, so, the, uh, and not to go off on a tangent, but this whole thing about, like, oh, you know, people wasting time watching movies, playing video games, is childish and stuff, it's like, it's been around for a very long time. I think it's the, because that our pop culture has become a lot more mainstream due to the internet and the fact that comic books are, are being adapted into movies and are being generated to appeal to a m more mainstream audience, it's now getting the attention that has gotten to this point. Oh, yeah, definitely. Anyway, and, you know, there, then there's comic book conventions. Oh, my God. I don't even want to go into that because it's been around for a long time. And, you know, it, over in, like, the past, like, 20-something years has gotten big. But, you know, we I, I think that we're getting off topic. So yeah. I think that now we can go over to Telltale's downfall. So oh, why don't you start us off with that, Jim? 
Okay, well, like I said, 2017 was kind of the sign that they were really starting to overwork themselves with all the projects they were trying to get out, and they just could not sustain it on the current team. So back in, I believe it was October or November of last year, they laid off about 25% of their staff, said that they were restructuring, going to try to work on smaller projects, but obviously that didn't work. The funding for some future projects fell through, and a few weeks ago, Telltale announced that they were having massive layoffs. They were only going to sustain themselves on a skeleton crew to try and get the last season of The Walking Dead out. But in the last few days, they've announced that even that skeleton crew has been laid off. Ah, uh, yeah. That, that, and also, uh, from what I've been hearing, you know, that they're being sued for doing that because, you know, they're essentially, like, breaking a law stating about, like, you know, the, I mean, these yeah. people were not even going to get paid they were not getting severance pay for being laid off yeah. yeah i know and that's the that's the atrocious thing right there all these all these employees who sacrificed so much of their time and their well-being some of whom moved from other states to work for this company they just get cut out no pay no benefits no severance but of course you know the guys on top they get to walk away with everything yeah and that really sucks <laughs> it is but I did hear that there have been some people, um, you know, in the industry who have been trying to, you know, share, um, you know, Telltale's, um, you know, uh, you know, they, they've been trying to help Telltale out with, you know, looking for work. I think um, from what I recall, um, uh, Corey from, you know, who is the director of the God of War series, kind of like told Telltale other, either on Facebook or Twitter saying like, you know, um, you know, uh, Telltale, you know, please pay these people up, you know, that they deserve, you know, all the hard work that they've put into making your games. And, you know, even like some of the former Telltale employees are on Twitter right now saying, you know, please help me find a job. I did this game and this game and this game and so on and so forth. So, yeah, as of a few days ago, um, you know, there's been some speculation that that it could be possible that, you know, Walking Dead, the final season might be out in some way, shape or form. Yeah, my best guess is it's probably going to be like a Half-Life 3 scenario when so where someone who worked on the team just like leaks the story out online. Hmm. Yeah, but and there I, were a lot of games that were, you know, not only, I mean, not not just, you know, Walking Dead the final season, but there were a lot of other games that were canceled, including a Stranger Things game. It would have been interesting to see their take on that, definitely. Yeah, because, you know, as mentioned earlier about, like, them taking a darker direction, I mean, Stranger Things, you know, is kind of dark at times. Yeah. I will say, though, it is kind of, it is very, you know, satisfying to see that other members of the game industry are reaching out and offering, you know, assistance. Because aside from showing how uh, bad practices were at Telltale, this is another sign of just how bad things can be for the industry in general. We've had a lot of companies close down this year. Um, I think the last big one before this was Boss Key, the one Cliff Blazinski put it together. Yes, that's the one. Yeah. And, I mean, it's just... It's just a rough industry, especially because, you know, from what I've heard, a lot of these developers and writers and coders, they don't have unions. No, they don't. Especially if it's a small um, gaming company that has less than 500 employees. Uh, yeah, that's but I mean, I'm personally not the biggest union guy myself, but I mean, if your company is offering it, I mean, I think companies should offer it and at least give people the right to decide if they want to join or not yeah i mean you can compare union and non-union even to voice actors about how you know there's uh, like if you're an anime voice actor you only get paid like a like maybe like less than 50 something dollars an hour well if you're work if you're a union voice actor and if you work for maybe like two three or four hours you get like 900 dollars or something and let's not even talk about yeah go ahead it's like 800 900 a day. Yeah, that, and, and don't don't even get me started on Simpsons voice actors. Like holy crap. I I've never seen yeah. a paycheck for a voice actor that huge in my life. Like they would get paid like millions of dollars for an episode. There was even a, yeah. a recent article about how Japanese voice actors are just shocked about how much money a Simpsons voice actor gets paid to do a voice uh, you know, voice role for a day. I know, especially because they haven't really been putting in good effort. I mean, not the voice has, but the show itself hasn't really been that good for the last decade and a half. So it's still amazing that they're bringing in this much money. 
Yeah. And but that's, with, that's, that's for another day. Yeah, that's for another day. And the whole, you know, 20th century bo- Fox being purchased by Disney. Oh, man, that's another can of worms. I'm sure we'll get to that in a, in a future episode of Casual yeah. Chats. But anyway, um, it's funny because um, Aaron and I were we were discussing about Telltale's shutdown, uh, I think, about two weeks ago as of the making of this podcast. And one of the things that Aaron pointed out was that um, you know, very similar to how, um, you know, adventure games were kind of like dead around the 2000s. They're, you know, I mean, they're, you know, you kind of see like the um, the crux of it now with like, you know, ever since the likes of Mass Effect and Fable brought in the whole, you know, make a decision and it, it influences this part. But I think that um, if you with with um, adventure games, it's kind of like stop, touch and go, stop, touch and go. So maybe the flow of it is not... It doesn't, like, really cater to, like, the younger generation in which, you know, they're accustomed to, like, oh, you know, constant movement and constant action and, you know, storytelling. I mean, even cutscenes, you know, they're not used as much anymore. So, you know, yeah, a game that's making... constantly flowing, you know, it's it's like the norm nowadays. Yeah, and that's one thing that also I think Telltale helped generate with the idea of, you know, having to constantly, you know, you have the options in front of you that the dialogue is still going. Mm -hmm. So you have to make your decision quick or else you won't have anything else uh, or else you will miss the opportunity. Right, right. And then then basically you just, uh I mean, you have no other choice but to either accept the decision or restart the game. Right. And that's, if I may say one thing, though, that I think that definitely hindered Telltale style is that whenever you made a big decision, you always had this warning that would say, you know, X character will remember this. So it was kind of like telling you that you had made a huge impactful decision. And I kind of think that hurt because if you feel you made the wrong decision, then, okay, I'll just say, I'll just reload from an earlier save and fix it. Right. Some other, uh, this was remedied by some former Telltale devs who founded uh, Night School Studios and they made a game called Oxen Free that came out back in 2016. And this remedied that problem because while you still have to do quick choices for uh, dialogue responses, it did not tell you which one had impact. So whatever decision you made, you had to live with it. You could not just go back and redo it unless you wanted to go through a lot of save points. Yeah, or you can pull off the Undertale route in which you try restarting a game, they're going to point it out saying you have to live with the decision that you make. Yeah, but like, this is a, but yeah again that's something that I think that definitely hurt Telltale especially when you have games like Life is Strange or Until Dawn which are again heavily choice driven but when they tell you oh you might want to, oh this decision is going to have an impact then you're kind of just telling the players are you sure you're happy with that it's like at the start of some of those Fallout it's like what was it Fallout Three where you go through that path in your history and yeah. you get to the big dramatic point where you have to leave the vault after all hell breaks loose and then you get this option oh are you okay with how everything went would you like to do it again which just totally kills the immersion mm-hmm. yeah i mean give the players a little uh respect for their intelligence let them be prepared to handle with the consequences of their decisions without being warned about it that's all i'm saying yeah sure um i don't think there's really that much to say uh do you want to give any final words about telltale right before we conclude it well I guess all I can say is that, you know, for as despite the slide that they went on in the last few years, they definitely put out some truly stellar games. Some of the best I've played this decade, Walking Dead, Wolf Among Us, Tales from the Borderlands, first season of Batman. And they spearheaded the the second age of adventure games, giving birth to, you know, helping inspire other studios like Wadjet Eye, which has also done great jobs with uh, reviving point and click adventure styles. So, you know. Thank you to all the people who worked the Telltale for the Legacy, and I hope that you get, uh, I hope that you get the respect and the due that's coming to you. Yeah, same thing here. Uh, even though that uh, it was a very small company, they were able to make a lot of games based off of adaptations. Which, you know, if you know, if I was to be heard that hey, you know, there's a good game based off of this property, I thought you, I, I thought you would have been insane because, you know, I was always in that stigma that you know most video game adaptations based off of movies and TV shows sucked, but because that Telltale was able to create a unique spin on it, I was able to appreciate what they were able to do, and you know, again, as mentioned before, you know, revitalizing a 
dead genre in video games after nothing new for all, over a decade was you know it, it does bring a lot of respect and kind of like one of the very first foundational points for indie games so uh yeah i wish the best for anybody who worked on telltale and hope that they can be able to create more games to come so yeah i think that's pretty much it for this episode uh jim thank you so much for coming on by thanks for having me uh please plug and promote your stuff well um as i meant as i mentioned earlier i'm a huge fan of the uh, riddler and i was reminded yesterday that this month marks the 70th anniversary since his debut back in october of 1948 so i'm probably going to put together a little something to commemorate that maybe you look at my 10 favorite uh comics that he was featured in and i've also got something special planned for manic expressions uh, 31 days of halloween i'm just going to give you a, a hint of the title so you have an idea of what it's about Porky Pig and Daffy Duck meet the Groovy Ghoulies. Oh, <laughs> I remember that. That should be really interesting. So, oh yeah, you heard you've heard people say how bad animation was in the seventies. This is probably the epitome of bad seventies cartoons. Yes, indeed. So that's it, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. Let us know in the comments below about how did you first get introduced to Telltale Games? What was your favorite game from that uh, lineup? What was your least favorite? And what are your thoughts? thoughts about the recent shutdown um got some really cool stuff coming for this month i have i'm actually putting out a video this month so yay finally after Hooray! like almost what has it been like almost like seven months oh my god but nonetheless it is something that i've been wanting to do for a very long time and uh yeah i can't wait for people to watch it so uh thank you so much hope to see you around soon and take care mm-hmm.